Amen. All right. This morning I'm going to be preaching a sermon that's going to be geared towards the fathers. Geared towards the fathers. The title is Humility in Leadership. Humility in Leadership. I want you to focus there in Mark chapter number 10 with me, particularly at verse number 42. Verse number 42, the Bible reads, But Jesus called them to him, and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. Verse 44, And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. I'm going to be preaching about the importance of humility in leadership. Humility in leadership. I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 15. 1 Samuel chapter number 15, verse number 16. I want to begin this morning uh, with an example of a, of a great man of God who fell because of a lack of humility. And when we look at a lot of the great men in the Bible uh, who have uh, accomplished great feats, they've done you know, uh, you know, just astronomical works for the Lord, if we try to identify their downfall almost every single time, it is a lack of humility or it is pride. Of course, the opposite of humility is pride. Uh, uh, Saul was the very first king the very first king that was anointed over Israel. I want you to look here in 1 Samuel chapter number 15, verse number 16 with me. These are the words that, that Samuel spoke to Saul. 1 Samuel chapter number 15, verse number 16, it says this, Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. So this is going to be the words of the Lord to, to Saul. Verse 17, And Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And then it says, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. Now, if you're familiar with the story of Saul, when they went to go find Saul to anoint him king, what happened? He was hiding. He was hiding. He was so humble that he was hiding himself. It said that he, he hid himself among the stuff. He didn't want to come out and stand in front of everyone, did he? he didn't, this was not necessarily a position that he himself wanted to take on. Now, if you look at prideful people, they are just, you know, just, just begging for the opportunity to have authority in different areas of life, aren't they? That is what a prideful person is, is, is striving for in their lives. And we see the exact opposite with Saul when he was anointed, he was chosen by the Lord. Not only that, we see one of the reasons why he was chosen. Look again at verse number 17. I don't know if you've caught this before, but it says this, When thou wast little in thine own sight. So it's saying his own appearance or his own perception of himself was small. He didn't look at himself as being something large or big. He says, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. So you know what else you find there? This is the Lord speaking, is the reason why the Lord chose Saul to be the king in the first place. You know what it was? It was because Saul, when he looked at himself, the way that he thought of himself, the way that he perceived himself in his own life, what was it? It was little. It's the exact attitude that David had. When, when David was serving under Saul, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Saul was trying to get him to, of course, uh, through deceit, he was trying to get him to, to uh, marry into his family, right? Because he wanted to slay him. He wanted him to fall at the hand of the Philistines and other armies and things like that. And he had one of the servants go to David and tell David, hey, you know, you could marry uh, you know, Saul's daughter. And he said, don't you know who I am? Do, do you think it's a light thing? To, to marry one of, the, one of the king's daughters. And he starts talking about how he is of the least of the tribes. He's of the least of the least of the tribes of, uh, of Israel. So how was David? And of course, David excelled also to this great high position. What type of attitude did David have? We know that the Lord anointed David. 
He had an attitude where he was little in his own sight. He had an attitude where he was very small in his own sight, where he didn't look at himself and, and perceive himself as being some great thing. He wasn't, you know, greatly puffed up. Now, here in 1 Samuel chapter number 15, this record of Samuel coming to Saul, this is actually the pronouncement against Saul that the kingship is going to be taken from Saul. He's actually going to be taking the authority and the position of being king from Saul. And what's the reason? Well, he tells him, when thou wast little in thine own sight. What else can we learn from that? He's saying, in the past, you were little in your own sight. What's going on now? He obviously perceives himself as being something big, something being... And that's why we'll refer to people as being puffed up, right? Because they're big. That's what he's saying. So Saul, when he looks at himself now, what does he think? He thinks he's something big and important. And you know what happens? God takes that position from him. So you know what we can see just right here already? The very first king that is anointed over Israel, the entire reason why it was anointed was what? Because of his humility. Because of his lack of pride, if you will. Why was David anointed? Because of his great humility. Because he was a humble man. That shows the importance of humility when it comes to leadership. The importance of humility when it comes to leadership. Now, for whatever reason, <clears throat> humility and pride is something that people have a very hard time understanding when it comes to leadership. You know, they, they'll look at someone that is like a strong leader. They'll look at someone that is bold. They'll look at someone that is taking hard stances and they'll say, that person is proud, right? That person is a very proud person. Those two things have nothing to do with one another. Nothing at all. Humility is the way in which you perceive yourself. The way in which you look at yourself. And also you can see humility worked out in the way in which someone lives their life. Are they living their life for themselves? Are they living their life for someone else? So there's a spectrum here. There's two different ways where people can confuse humility and pride. Number one is some people have this idea that a leader is supposed to be this obnoxious, arrogant type of loudmouth, right? Where you're just supposed to stand up here and just yell at people and talk about how great you are and things like that and belittle others. That's obviously not the purpose of a leader when it comes to regards of humility. But then also you have the opposite of that as well where people think in order to be a, a, a humble person, you have to be a pushover. You can't stand up on your own two feet and say, hey, this is the way that we're going to do things. Uh, you can't, they don't want you to be decisive. A lot of times it's because they're not in the position of leadership and they want, they don't like you telling them what to do. That's oftentimes the, where this will come from. But so people will confuse humility and pride and they'll confuse boldness, uh, you know, all in this mix. And there's this big spectrum where people have a lot of trouble just understanding, you know, uh, uh, you know, the true aspect of humility when it comes to leadership. In reality, a leader should be bold, he should be strong, and he should be decisive. He should be someone that can and does make decisions. But here's the thing. He should be making decisions for the people that he is leading and not for himself. He should be focusing on not himself, but the people that he is leading. I want you to turn to Numbers chapter number 12. The book of Numbers chapter number 12. We find a great example of a leader, <clears throat> of a leader in the Bible, <coughs> one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, of course, and this is Moses. And I want you to notice one of the great uh, um, attributes that Moses had. And think of also the great relationship that Moses had with God. Of course, he was the, he's, he's referred to as the friend of God, right? Just like Abraham is. Only those two are referred to that, right? And uh, not only that, it talks about him speaking to God face to face. So God obviously revealed things to him. We saw his back parts, right? And uh, he was given, you know, a, uh, a privileges and opportunities that no other man was given. And, of course, he was the leader of the nation of Israel through one of the greatest feats of Israel when they were brought out of bondage. I mean, Moses was one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Sometimes he can be overlooked as a prophet, but he's referred to as a prophet many times. He's one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, really, if not the greatest. And I want you to notice one of the uh, personality traits that the Bible is very careful to point out, to make sure that you know about Moses. It says this in verse number uh, 3. It says this, Now the man Moses was very meek. What does meek mean? It means humble, right? It says, Now the man Moses was very meek, and then it goes on to say this, 
above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. So that means that according to the Holy Spirit, according to God, that Moses was the most humble man. He was the meekest man above everyone upon the face of the earth. Now, was Moses a person that was in a position of leadership? He was. He was the leader of, he was the head of, of, the, of the church in the wilderness, if you will, right? Of Israel. He was the leader of the entire nation of Israel. And what's an attribute that Moses had? He was very meek. Now, was Moses a pushover? Not even close. So this is where we can kind of get the idea of humility. You know, a particular uh, thing that, st that stands out to me about Moses that he did uh, was when they made the golden calf and he comes down and him and Joshua and they hear the, the noise. He's like, you know, that's not the noise of war, right? Neither is it the, you know, it's not the noise of, of a victor, nor is it uh, the noise of them which be overcome, right? He says, he go, they go down, you know, he knows that it's of, of uh, like a celebration of dance. He goes down there and what does he find? He finds the golden calf. Does anyone remember what he did with the golden calf? He took the golden calf and he, and he broke it up and he melted it down and he ground it up into liquid. And you know what he made the people do? He made the people drink the calf. Now does that sound like a pushover? Keep that in mind. He made all the nation of Israel, hey, this is what you want? Well, you can have it then. So that sound like Moses was a pushover? Not at all. He was obviously an extremely strong leader all throughout you know, uh, uh, the story of the nation of Israel, when he's leading them through the wilderness, he's very decisive. He stands up and he does what needs to be done. But you know what the Bible says he was? He was the meekest man upon the face of the earth. He was the most humble man upon the face of the earth. He had great humility, but was he a pushover? No. Was he bold? Yes. Was he decisive? Yes. So these two things can, can coexist. So people have a very uh, confused and, 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 and skewed idea of you know uh, boldness and humility and pride so we need to understand the Bible's definition of these types of words I want you to go to uh, go with me now to Luke chapter number 22 verse number 23 Luke chapter number 22 verse number 23 so that gives us an idea of humility of meekness now another aspect of Moses <coughs> where we can see his humility and like I had pointed out of, of him uh, putting others first right uh, that is that is the definition of someone that's being humble right they they are little in their own sight right like it talked about Saul and they, what they do is they magnify others they try you know they seek uh, others first the things of others first and, they, and and a leader specifically if he's going to be leading others he should be there ministering and serving unto them and helping them and doing things uh, for them. And that's exactly what we see Moses doing. There's a time in which God says, hey, I'm going to destroy all of the nation of Israel. I'm going to wipe every single one of them out. And then Moses stands up and steps up to God and says, hey, you know, instead of doing that, blot me out of your book. He says, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. You know what he says? He says, hey, take me in place of them. So what is he doing? He's willing to sacrifice himself for those that he's leading. Who's he putting first? He's putting his flock first, if you will. He's putting those that he's leading first, if you will, as opposed to himself. Here we're going to see in Luke chapter number 22, a parallel of what we read earlier. Look at Luke chapter number 22. I want you to look at uh, verse number 23. <clears throat> verse number 23. It says, And they began to inquire among themselves uh, which of them it was that should do this thing. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 24 really is the context. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. So the disciples are sitting here, and this is a, you know, a lot of times people get the wrong idea about the disciples at the time when Christ was on the earth. And the disciples were almost like, you know, I, I don't want to uh, uh, downplay the great things that they did, but it seems like you're like, you're watching the record of like the Three Stooges oftentimes. Very simple things they don't understand. They say dumb stuff often. And it's because we look at them as, you know, when Peter wrote First Peter or when he's during the book of Acts. But what they are at this time is babes in Christ. That's really what you have at the time when Jesus is on this earth. You have, you have a bunch of men that are, that are new Christians, that are following the Lord Jesus Christ around, and he's teaching them things. There's oftentimes very silly, stupid things that he has to rebuke them for. So you have the disciples sitting together, and they're arguing amongst each other like, I'm going to be the greatest. And then the other guys, John's like, no, Peter, I'm, I'm going to be the greatest. 
And then you got, you know, I doubt that Judas entered into this conversation. But you got everybody else, you know, uh, uh, Thomas standing up and saying, no, I'm the greatest. So they're just arguing amongst each other. I mean, how immature does that sound? It's, it's, it's ridiculous when you really start playing it out in your mind. And they're all saying, like, when, 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 when Jesus is gone, you know, I'm going to be the one that's going to step up and be the greatest. So they're trying to, you know, usurp authority over one another, which is, of course, very immature, isn't it? Is it, is it showing humility? It's the exact opposite of that. What are they doing? They're trying to de desire this office for what reason? Because of pride. Now, a lot of people, they will desire a position of leadership just because of pride. That's the reason that will compel them to that. Look at, uh, look at the very next verse. Look at what it says in verse number 25. <clears throat> and he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat. And then he says, but I, but I am among you, as he that serveth. Now look back there at verse number 26. Notice what he says. He says, but ye shall not be so. So when you look out at the world, what you see is, you see the one that's the greatest, you know, he exercises all of the authority over everyone. And what do they do? You know, they will usurp the authority in a lot of areas, won't they? They'll, they won't be the one that picks up the cross, will they? They won't be the one that goes out of the way. When you go oftentimes to, and you look at uh, the way that companies are ran, they're ran exactly this way. Oftentimes the, the leader on the job site, the, the, the lead that's actually on the job site, he's only walking around and pointing out, hey, you do this, you do that, right. But is he willing to, to help out oftentimes? He's not, is he? He's not the one doing the work himself, is he? That's what Jesus is pointing out here. I want you to look at what it says next. Verse 26, uh, but ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, so the one that is going to be the greatest among you, <clears throat> Let him be as or like the younger. Keep reading. It says, and he that is chief, like he that is grace, he's repeating the same thing, as he, and then he explains more, that doth serve. So I want you to notice one of the main uh, aspects of a person that is going to be the leader or that is going to be the greatest. What is he going to be doing? He's going to be serving. Oftentimes a pastor is referred to as what? A minister, right? A minister. Now, was Jesus the boss of the disciples? Did he call the shots? 100%. He called the shots. He told them, hey, we're going here, we're going there. You two, you guys go together. You two, you guys go together. He called the shots, but notice what it says in verse number 27. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth. Is not he that sitteth at meat? And then he says, but I am among you as he that serveth. So, his point is this, who's greater, me or you? They understand, Jesus is much greater. And he's like, if we look at the world's system, and we look at the servant, and we look at the person that's sitting there being served, who's the greatest? Who would you say is the greatest? You'd say the person that's seated, that's being served. And then he's like, obviously they understand, who's greater, me or you? In the sense of Jesus or his disciples, Jesus is. And then he says, but I am among you as he that serveth. So what is Christ doing? What type of attitude does Christ have? Christ have. He has an attitude of humility. And what is he doing? He is serving. That's his job. He, he, he came to serve. Turn to, uh, we'll see this further. I want you to turn to, um, over there in Luke 22, turn to Matthew chapter number 23. Matthew chapter number 23. We get more of, a, of an expanded view of this. He elaborates more on this if we uh, compare... This uh, same statement, the same uh, thing being taught, Matthew chapter number 23. I want you to look at verse number 11 with me. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 23, verse number 11, it says this, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servants. I want you to notice that. Whoever is the greatest, what is their job to do? The person that is in authority, what is their job to do? Their job is to serve. What is their job? Their job is to put others First, to seek after the things of others and not for themselves. Look at verse 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. 
And then it says, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Now, of course, the disciples, they served with Christ while on this earth, and that was their time wherein they needed to learn from Christ, and they needed to be put into a position where they were not in authority, right? That's why it says here, we can learn from this, from that aspect, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. If a person is going to try to exalt themselves or put themselves into a position that they do not deserve, the Bible says that they're going to be brought low. But if you are willing to humble yourself, if you are willing to humble yourself and, and maybe serve under someone else or, or serve, you know, learn from someone, uh, maybe if you are training or maybe if you are uh, even in the position of, of uh, when I'm going to get to this uh, shortly, of being a father. You know, we all had to be in that position where we're not in authority at one point. And this, this is the circle of life. This is how everything works. You can never just jump right into a position of authority. It doesn't work like that. And that's why you need to train under someone who is in that position and has already went through the things that you've done and they understand this position and you learn from them. Whether this be at work or wherever it may be, at church or at work or even in the home. Do you know how you start off? You start off with having a father of your own, where you're under his authority, where you're learning from him. And you know what you learn during that course of time? You learn humility. That's why this circle is designed this way. You learn to be humble. Because one of the greatest, one of the most important, let me say, one of the, the, the most critical characteristics of a leader is to be humble. And if you do not have humility, you'll be brought low. If you do not have humility and you step into a position of leadership, you will not only destroy yourself, but you will destroy everyone else around you. Whether that be your family, whether that be your church, whether that be a company. If you, if you go into a position of leadership and you yourself did not spend time serving in humility under someone else, you will fail. You will fail. I want you to go with me now to uh, Exodus chapter number 33, verse number 11. We're going to look at this from a spiritual aspect. This is, of course, the best way to look at this from a spiritual aspect, and then we'll apply it more so to the fathers. <clears throat> Every great man of God, whether it be the disciples, the apostles, whoever it may be, they spent time learning under someone else spiritually. Whatever position that they're in, a deacon, a prophet, an apostle, whatever it is, they spent time under someone else and they spent time as a servant. They spent time learning in humility under someone else. I want you to look at Exodus chapter number 33, verse number 11. <clears throat> Exodus chapter number 33, verse number 11. We're going to see this about Joshua. Notice what Joshua is, is referred to as. Now, was Joshua a great man of God? He was. Joshua was a great man. Did many great, great things for the nation of Israel as a leader. And that's how we normally look at him. But that's not how Joshua started out. Joshua started out as a servant serving. I want you to look at Exodus chapter number 33, verse number 11. It says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. I alluded to that earlier. Then it says this, <coughs> And he turned again into the camp. And then it says this, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed, out, uh, departed not out of the tabernacle. Now notice what Joshua is referred to as, as this, at this time. What is that? His servant. Whose servant is it talking about? It's talking about Moses. So he's actually referred to as the servant of Moses during this period of time, right? So, well, of course, we still see the humility of Moses while he's in the position of leadership, of he's putting other people first, right? But there is a difference in between the actual authority structure, right? Uh, and then the, the uh, job title or the job description, if you will. So the authority structure in this case was that Moses was at the top. Moses was at the top of the, of the, uh, the chain of authority. And you know who was right directly underneath of him was Joshua. And he's actually referred to as the servant of Moses. It says, his servant, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, it says, a young man, it says, departed not out of the tabernacle. So you know what he was there following Moses around. You know what he was doing? He was learning from Moses. He was learning everything that he could from Moses. We see this with Elijah and Elisha. Now, who did the greater works, Elijah or Elisha? 
Really, Elisha did because he received the double portion of Elijah, didn't he? But you know, there's a time in which Elisha, when Elisha was just following Elijah. You know what he was doing? He was serving Elijah. There's actually an example that's given where Elijah, or I'm sorry, Elisha poured water on the hands of Elijah. You know, that takes great humility. That takes great humility. You know what he was doing? He was serving Elijah. He was serving who was in that situation, you know, his authority. You know, and uh, we see the same thing with Joshua here. He's referred to as the servant of Moses. And where is he at? He's there and he's with and he's waiting on Moses. You know what he's doing? He's serving. I want you to go to uh, Numbers chapter number 11. We'll see this again. See another example of this in Numbers chapter number 11. <clears throat> Numbers the book of Numbers, chapter number 11. Over and over again, we'll see this title being given to uh, Joshua as being Moses' servant. Numbers, chapter number 11, verse number 28, it says this, And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. Now notice the, the respect and the honor that he has to Moses as well. Notice he says, My Lord, right? And... and uh, before that we see it, in Joshua the son of Nun, it says the servant of Moses. The servant of Moses. What, what was he during this time period? He was serving Moses, wasn't he? Do you know what he's learning? He's learning humility. He's learning humility. God has set this type of system up so that when a person steps into the posi position of leadership, they have one of the most critical characteristics in order to succeed in leadership. If you do not have humility, you will fail. If you look at any, any great man of God that you know that fell, do you know why? Because of a lack of humility. Because of pride. You look at the Bible, you look at those that succeeded in the Bible as great men of God, do you know what they have? They have humility. Look at David. Look at the man of God, David, and how great he ended up uh, you know, finishing his life. Yes, he had you know, uh, uh, grievous sins that he committed, but here's the thing almost everybody does in the Bible. If we were to look at the whole picture of your life, and when you finish, you know, God forbid, you don't have any great fall, but the majority of the great, great men in the Bible, they have a major mistake, even sometimes later in life. So we see that with David. But we also see him finishing his race. We also see him finishing his course and correcting his problems when even when he does commit you know, great, great sins against God. And we look at the book of Psalms and you can, you can peer into the heart of David and you know what you see in there? A whole lot of humility. You see a lot of humility coming from the great man of God. And of course we know that he was a man after God's own heart. What was the reason why he chose Saul? What was the reason why he chose David? Because of their great humility. Because they were little in their own sight. You know why? Because if God's going to put someone in the position of leadership, do you know what they have to have? They have to have humility. They have to have humility. That is almost, almost the, all of the times that you see anyone fall in your life in the Bible... Every time. Let that sink in. It's because of a lack of humility or it's because of pride in their life. I want you to look with me now. Go to Joshua chapter number 1. We'll see this one more time. <clears throat> notice what it says here. And notice the words. And notice he was referred to as the servant previously. So we can see things, uh, we see more so what the word serve or servant means. Joshua chapter number 1, verse number 1, it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun. And then it says, Moses' minister, saying. Now what was he referred to previously as? Servants. You know what servant means is minister. Notice what he was doing. He's Moses' minister. He's there to serve Moses and to help Moses and to be the helper of Moses, just like Elisha was for Elijah. Why? Because before you step into a position of leadership, you have to learn humility. You must have humility. You know, uh, it's a recipe for disaster when someone just steps right into position of authority. You know why oftentimes you see uh, people fail in companies when their father, you know, owns the company, he built the company himself? You know what he'll do? They'll take the company and they'll just hand it off to one of their children. And a lot of times, they don't spend time serving in the back shop. They don't spend times out in the field working and sweating and bleeding and crying and all that type of stuff, right? All of the, the hard work that goes into starting a company, right? Do you know what they do? They just get it handed to them. And you know what happens in the second generation? And it's extremely common. Look it up. The company 
fails. Do you know why? A lack of humility. Because they never spent the time serving. Because they never spent that time serving. You know, that first generation, you know what they did? They had to serve. They had to work hard for what they had. They had to do the menial tasks. They did things that built humility. And then the other, the, their, the, by the time their, their children were born, they grew up with, a, with, a, with a, a silver spoon in their mouth, if you will, right? And they just had it just handed to them. Hey, here's all this authority. When they never had the time of being a servant. They never spent the time as being a Joshua. They never spent the time like Elisha did. You know what happened? Pride destroys them. Because you, ha you must be humble as a leader. And what does it mean to be humble? It means to put other people first. It means to put other people first when you're in the position of leadership. That is the purpose of the leader in and of itself. That's why a pastor is referred to as a minister. A, a, even a, uh, a father. That is the job of a father. It is to put his family first. It is to put, of course, his children first and not serving his own belly. I want you to turn with me. Uh, let's go to um, 2 Corinthians. You can wait for me there. 2 Corinthians chapter number 14. I'm going to read to you again from, Math, from Mark chapter 10 verse 42 where we began. It says this, But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, but their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest, and then it says, shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, the greatest father that could grow up, and, and, or the, the, the greatest position that a, that, a, that a man could be put into in order to be a successful father would be a father that as a child was humble and was a servant unto his own dad and was a servant unto his own father. Now you may or may not have done this and may or may not have had this opportunity as a child but the principle applies across the board. You must learn humility from somewhere and the only place that you get it is learning to serve under someone else. We all must, before taking on some sort of position, we have to be taught from someone else, right? We have to, to learn uh, you know, a trade or whatever it may be. So we all have these opportunities in different areas of life to grow in humility and to develop uh, in uh, this particular aspect or this particular character, uh, characteristic of humility. And we see even, uh, you know, uh, the greatest father that ever could be, right? The everlasting father. Yeah, I said that. The everlasting father. And what did he do? He humbled himself. He, he showed humility and was willing to come down to this earth. And, you know, it's, he was made a little lower than the angels. I mean, comprehend that. He went and he served amongst his uh, his disciples. Go to, uh, I hope I have this right, John 14. Let's look at this. So keep, keep your hand there in 2 Corinthians. Go to John chapter number 14. I'm, I'm, I feel confident about this, but let's see. <clears throat> no, it's John 13. I want you to look at John chapter number 13. I want you to look at verse number... Um, three or four. We'll, we'll start at four. Now look at verse three. That's interesting how that's worded right before it. Verse three. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. Now notice that. What does that mean? It's talking about authority that's going to be granted unto him, right? And that he was come from God and went to God. Look at verse four. He riseth from supper. I'd never noticed that until now. That's interesting. And then he riseth from supper and lay aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. So knowing that he is in this position of authority and that it's going to be given to him, it's saying that's the reason why. Keep reading, verse 5. After that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Look at the great humility of the everlasting Father, of the King of kings and Lord of lords. He bows down on his knees and he gets a basin and fills it up with water and he gets a towel and girds himself, right? He's got this towel, whether it be a longer towel, and it's hanging, you know, I'm assuming on his girdle, on his belt, like a, maybe a long towel to where it's able to reach their feet. And he's just dipping it in the water and just wiping each person's feet and cleaning each one of their feet, each of the 12 disciples' feet, one person after the next person after the next person. While they just sit there, 
While their master and their Lord and the God of the universe, the man that created them, got down upon his knees and he served them and ministered unto them and washed and cleaned their feet. Look at the great humility of the Lord. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 14. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 14. We can see this, that, that as a father, we are meant, we are also meant to serve. Now, does that mean that we don't have authority? Does that mean that we're not the boss? Of course not. That's silly. A lot of people don't understand humility. It, what it means is that you're not serving yourself. What it means is that you're not big in your own sight, that you're not puffed up, that you're not making all the decisions for your family based upon your own lust and based upon the things that you want. As a father, do you know what you should be doing? You should be having humility and leadership. You should be like Moses is what you should be like. You should be a humble, meek man and you should be putting your family first. You should be willing to, like I spoke about husbands loving their wives, the same concept. You should be willing to die for your wife. You should be willing to die for your children. You should be showing love to your children in these areas. You should be sacrificing you know, uh, your own wants, your own desires, all of those things for your family. Right? Now, is it just getting your children everything that they want? No, because you'll turn them into a spoiled brat. You know what it's doing? It's being a leader and you making the decisions yourself, not allowing them to say, hey, I want this, I want that. You knowing what they need and you supplying that for them. Do you know what they need? Obviously, they need food. They need shelter. They need things like that. But you know what else they need more than anything? They need the Word of God. They need an example. Of a, of a good, godly man in their lives, teaching them what a man is supposed to be like. What a father is supposed to be like. Teaching your sons how they're, supposed to, how they're supposed to be a parent unto their children, how they're supposed to be a father unto their children when they grow up. Not only that, teaching your daughters what a good husband would look like one day. Right? They need you to be being an example for them. They need you to be teaching them the Word of God. They need you just to be an example for them in their own lives in every area. Not only, hey, being an example for what I need as a husband, not only being an example for what I need when I become a father, but just teaching them godly characteristics. Teach them humility. Let them see you be humble in lives. Let, let them watch you sacrifice things for yourself, you know, things that you desire and you want for others. Let them look at you and see a good, godly example of humility and meekness. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 14. It says this, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents but the parents for the children. So you notice what that says? It says, For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. You know what that means? You also need to be a servant unto your children. You know what that, and what does that mean? Does that mean just them giving you orders? No. The church of Corinth did not give Paul orders. Far from it. See how people can get this confused in their mind? Sometimes you just need to unbrainwash yourself. No, you're decisive. You're strong. You're bold as the father. You are the one that's the leader of the household. You know, of course there needs to be a, 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 an aspect of fear even in the child to their father because they know that, hey, dad means business when he sets rules in the house and I can't break them, right? You're a strong leader, but do you know what it means? It means you spend your time seeking what's best for them. Not getting them the car they want, not getting them the toy that they want, those types of things, but seeking their spiritual needs throughout their lives. Doing what you need to do to help them. When you're tired and you come home from work one day, you know what you need to do? You need to sit down for dinner and you need to pray with your family and show them, hey, this is what you need to be doing. You, once you're finished, you know what you need to do? Go in the other room and read the Bible and teach the Bible to your children if they're able to understand these things. Teach them. Sing hymns to them if they're young. Be a godly spiritual example unto your family. You know, try, try to embed and impress upon them as, as, as much as you can the importance of walking in the light. You know, anyone who knows my children well, they sing hymns constantly. Do you know why? Because I sing hymns all the time, all the time at the house. Now, I'm not, a per I'm not perfect in every area of my life, but I take my family very seriously. And I take fatherhood extremely seriously. And every opportunity that I get, I try to teach my children, you know, uh, 
you know, the ways of the Lord and the Word of God. And, and I try to put little things in there, here and there, wherever I can. Because it's important. You know what I'm doing? I'm serving my children, whether they know it or not. Because I'm not looking out for myself. So I could go do something for me. There are plenty of things that I have my own personal interests and hobbies in that I could spend my own time doing, but that's not what's important. What's important is serving my family and being a, a true father and a true leader in humility to my family. You know what you're doing? For your children, whether you realize it or not, you are molding them into what they're going to be one day. All those hymns that they're singing, all the, the scripture verses that they hear, they're going to... They're staying in their brain forever. They're going to be there somewhere, whether subconsciously, consciously, whatever it may be. They're going to remember the words to those hymns, especially songs, man. Kind of off topic a little bit, but you know, just, as an example, just songs stay in your mind forever. And we sing the hymns for a reason, because they are doctrinal. You know, I was just reading yesterday, and uh, I pointed this out during my Bible reading to Michaela, of uh, the song, Sorrow and, and, what is it, Crying? Shall flee away. Is that what it is? Does anyone know where that's from? Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35 the very end of Isaiah 35. And, and what I pointed out to her specifically, I had noticed it was in there, but what I pointed out to him specifically is in that particular verse, he says something along the lines of, In that day, you know, uh, there shall be joy and a song in their mouth. So that's obviously the reason what compelled that person that wrote that hymn. And then he goes on to talk about it. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And he said, you know, I'm sure the guy said, that's a good song right there. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I'd noticed that that's where that came from before, but then I'd noticed, uh, uh, yesterday when I was doing some of my Bible reading, I had noticed for the first time that it points out that, that the, the, of that song, sorrow and sighing shall flee away. You know, we need to Im embed and impress upon the importance of spiritual things to our children. You know the way you're going to do that? It's you as a father serving your children. Now, are they going to tell me what to do? You know, you better not try, right? You know, I'm the boss, and I'm the leader of the household. But you know what I'm going to spend my time doing? Looking out for the things of my children. I, they don't need to lay up for me. I'll lay up for them. I'll sacrifice things for my children. And especially as the father. As the father, you're the one of the household. You're the, you, you are the leader of the household. You know what your job is? Show humility. and Stop thinking about yourself. Show humility and meekness and stop living your life for yourself. Start living your life for your kids. Start living your life for, obviously, God as the head. Live your life for the Lord. But God gave you a family to work with and to teach and to guide and to lead. And you know what you need to do? You need to spend your time, as far as humanly speaking, trying to guide and lead them in the Lord. That's what you need to do. You need to, you're molding your children in who they are going to be one day. You're, you are creating who they are going to be as a person. Set an example for them in humility. Set an example. Show them people are so confused. Are so, it's so rare that you find a good leader today. Someone who is willing to actually stand on their two feet. They're either too weak or they're just an arrogant jerk. There, there's, there's no medium or moderate position where people have where they actually understand humility and boldness at the same time. Be an example for your children in that area. Show them what a true leader is supposed to be like. Show humility. Be humble. Be, you can be humble and you can be bold. You know, when, my, when I make a mistake, I, you know, if I punish my children for something, I make a habit of this. If I punish my children for something that they didn't do and I find out about it, I apologize to them. There's nothing wrong with that. If you think there's something wrong with that, you're proud. You're proud. That's why. If I make a mistake and, and my children like see me doing it or, it, or it affects them in some way, or let's say this. If I make a mistake, I'll admit that I'm wrong. And I'll, and I'll, try, to make, and I'll try to make sure that my children have... I've done that numerous times. I'll try to make sure that they see me say, hey, I was wrong about that. Or if I punish them or do something to them or make them do something or yell at them maybe about something that they did not do, I will tell them, hey, I'm sorry. I was wrong about that. You know a person that thinks like, that, that's not right, is a proud person. That's what it is. Do you know what I'm doing? I'm showing them humility. you know what they're going to do when they grow up then? When they're wrong, they're going to be willing to admit they were wrong too. If they do something wrong to someone else, they'll go to that person and say, hey, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Hey, forgive me, right? So if you, even in the sense of, hey, you're not perfect, right? 
That doesn't question your authority. If you, know, if you have a good grip and you're strong, you're a strong leader, that's not going to question your authority in your household. You know, trust me, it doesn't question my authority in my household at all with my children. Not even slightly. Right? It doesn't diminish, you know, they, my, my children, of course, still respect me and fear me. You know what it does? It teaches them, hey, there's a balance here. You know, my father is, is really the leader. He is, he is the, he's the boss. And I wouldn't mess with him or anything like that. I wouldn't try to, he's not a pushover. But when he makes mistakes, he's willing to admit that he's wrong. He's willing to tell me that he's sorry. You know, so that's the type of father you need to be. You need to be a strong leader. That's humble. That's a good leader. That's the great... If I had to look at the... If I had to tell you who I thought was the greatest man of the Old Testament, obviously it would be you know, outside of David, but it's the same quality. I would say Moses. The two of the Old Testament are Moses and David. The, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they're all great guys, but I'm sorry. It's, it's Moses and it's David. David is a man after God's own heart. David would probably be first. You know, and, and you look at David and you get, to, you get to see into his heart and what does he have? He has extreme humility. Extreme humility, right? Talking about how he's weeping and things like that. Prideful people are the ones that are scared for people to see him cry or talk about him crying or things like that. A humble person is someone that's just like, hey, this is who I am, right? This is, this is the truth. You know, they're just, they, you know, a prideful person tries to, you know, they're trying to cover up any area of weakness in their life. Because they just want you to look at them in, in a light that's not real. That's not true, right? You know, so yeah, a lot of times, too, it's, it's that that person has, uh, um, you know, uh, they're trying to compensate because maybe they're not as strong as they think they are. That's the truth. You know, that, that is the truth. You see Jesus, now was he, was he weak? Not even close. He was extremely strong. On this earth, as a man, he's driving people out of the temple. He was not fearful of, of even, if, uh, even if people were to physically attack him. He was obviously not scared of that. Right? He was a strong man. And you know what he did? You know, when he was sad and people were standing around and his friend had died, he wept. You know, he wept. Why? Because he had humility. Because he was a perfect example of us. He, he's a perfect example of, of showing humility. You know what you had there? The everlasting father. You had a father being a great example of humility. We're going to end in Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 4. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number 6, <coughs> verse number 4. <clears throat> it says this, And ye fathers... Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now I want you to notice that. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know what you have to do to do that? You have to lay your own wants, your own desires, everything about yourself aside. And you have to spend time on your children. You know what you'd be doing? You'd be serving your children. You're doing work for them. That's what you're doing. You're teaching them the Bible like you're taking time out of your, your day. And, you're, and it's, it's work. And you're saying, hey, this is what this says. Like, it's just, you're teaching someone. It's like a teacher. They go to work and they do the same thing. It's work. You know what you're doing? You're serving them. A teacher is serving the, the children there. You understand the concept? That's what you're doing to your children. You're saying, hey, I have, and I'm sure you could find other things that you wanted to do. Hobbies, whatever it may be. Even something productive. But you're saying, hey, this is more important. You sit down. You teach your children the Bible. You sit down. You pray with them. You sit down. You know what you do? You raise them. You bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You know what you have to do to do that? You have to put them first. You have to set all of your own ambitions, all of your own you know, volitions, your own wills aside. And you have to magnify the, the needs of your children. The greatest, the greatest leader is a humble leader. The worst leader is a prideful leader. Because, here's the thing, he's, you, know, you know what you do is you'll, you'll, you'll provoke everyone to wrath if you're just a prideful person. And that's what that's talking about, provoking your children to wrath. You, you start contentions. Only by pride cometh contention. Do you understand that? Only by pride cometh contention. You know how you start a fight and you get people mad? By being proud. A proud father or a proud leader causes contention. That's where contentions come from. 
But a humble person, that's how things are run with nurture and admonition. A proud father is the one that brings contention in his household and he's, and he's bringing wrath, right? The most important aspect. You say, hey, I want to be a good leader. I want to be a good dad. I want to be just as a man. I want to be a good leader in every area of my life. Be humble. Amen. Have a humble heart. Humility is the most important thing. When God chooses someone out to be a leader, yeah, I'm sure there's other good qualities. I'm sure there was. But do you know what it specifically mentions showing that it's the most critical? When you were little in your own sight, God chose you. You see David, why was he chosen? He's young, right? All of these things. And then he goes, before he's brought into the kingship, he serves under Saul. It's another example of that. And he was very respectful and humble under Saul. You know what he was learning? He was learning humility before he stepped into the position of being a leader. So he, at that time, was a humble man. That's why God said, hey, I'm going to anoint you. The most, important, the most important virtue or characteristic of being a good leader is humility. Because the whole, your job is to be a servant in the first place. A leader, yes, decisive, bold, all these things, yes. Most of the time, those things come easy for a man. Most of the time. You know, unless you're not eating enough red meat, right? Most of the time, that's just how men are. Okay? But do you know, what com you know what's difficult? Is to balance that. Do you know what will be your fall as a leader? If you're not humble. So you need to learn to be humble and then you can excel or succeed in leadership later on in life or as a father. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord.